Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. It's really wonderful to be back uh, in India and so nice to be with uh, friends. I must say it is a little uh, um, overpowering when you see somebody like Jerry Rao here and to stand up and talk in front of Jerry is, uh, I, I was nervous about it 20 years or 25 years ago. I, I have to admit I'm nervous about it uh, this evening as well. Hopefully I'll do better now than I did uh, 25 years ago. But thank you, Jerry, uh, for being here. Uh, thank you, Banish. Thank you, Arun, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I left India many, many years ago. I left India in 1987 and have been uh, running around the world. Uh, and therefore, a lot of the comments that I will make are my reflections of how I've kind of moved uh, from country to country to country. Since I've already dated myself, I've been in retail banking now for something like uh, 30 years. I started with City in India under uh, Jerry, 1987, and have been part of a retail banker all these years. I can tell you with complete conviction that I have never been as excited about being a retail banker as I am today. I can also tell you with equal conviction that I've never been so challenged and I've never been so paranoid. I work today for Barclays in the UK. Barclays in the UK is 327 years old. Barclays is a company that was formed before the Bank of England. Barclays was definitely created much, much before the United States of America. And so you can imagine Barclays has seen everything from the Great Depression uh, to the global financial crisis and everything in between. The key th the key thought for me when I go to work every morning is that here is a brand, here is an iconic company which has been around for 327 years and it is now my responsibility to make sure that it is fit for purpose for the next at least 100 years, if not more. And in this context, the digital revolution is something that is, that is, that is an amazing, uh, amazing event, an amazing transformation. With that, let me share uh, some of my uh, thoughts uh, with you. First things first, you know, we all talk a lot about digital, digital revolution and stuff like that. I think it's important to define what does digital really mean? When we say retail banking in a digital revolution, what does that really mean? Uh, a lot of people uh, think about digital revolution only in terms of what the customer sees. But that clearly is not it. Clearly what the customer sees on the mobile, on the internet, is just the it's just one small element of it. A lot of people have then realized that, look, you can't just be digitized at the front end. You really got to automate completely front to back to the customer. That is extremely heavy lifting for incumbent banks. But the ability to take customer journeys and automate them so that the customer can self-serve where the customer wants or is served at the first point of contact becomes a very, very critical element. In all of this, in this digital world, what has become really critical is data. Data has become the new oil for all banks. And as we think about data, and I'll, get, I'll, I'll spend a little more time on data uh, uh, a little later, but data has become really critical because you've got to start thinking about what is the data architecture, data standards, data governance in this new kind of world? How do you deal with data? And with data, just knowing is not enough. Doing something with data becomes important. So as, in, as in people become more and more digital and do more and more stuff on the mobile phone and you see footfall into the branches and things kind of declining, you've got to learn how to be able to substitute all the sales, all the uh, things that you are doing for the customer in the branches now on the mobile. Now how much time does the customer really spend on the mobile and within those ma literally milliseconds, You've got to be able to pass a really, really personalized message. So you have to have the data to understand that. And obviously, you have to have instant fulfillment. Because if you don't have instant fulfillment, there's no point offering somebody something and not being able to fulfill uh, instantly. Data, it's incredible that when you think about it, banks have had so much data for so long. But frankly, banks have not made good use of the data. Because the data was never actually structured in a way that could be reused. Today, with, with data and the ability to you know, use platforms like Hadoop and get into the cloud, it's become a completely different ball game. Once you get into the cloud, 
then you can start really talking about things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and stuff like that, which then help this entire personalization journey and you get into this kind of virtu virtuous cycle. Digital also does not mean only technology. In fact, technology has become so important, it can't be left to the technologist alone. Digital def definitely does not mean only marketing or only front end. In fact, every single function has to go digital. Let me give you two extreme examples. I don't know if you know, but in the UK, for example, there is a product, when I walk into a branch now in India and I sit down with a, with a person and I see on the person's uh, table uh, awarded best insurance salesperson for the quarter or best, you know, uh, whatever, loan salesperson for the quarter, I can actually feel the shivers go down my spine. And the reason the shivers go down my spine is because in the UK, we paid such extreme amounts of redress and fines for actually selling to customers what could be perceived as something what the customer does not want to buy. Just one product, just one product for credit insurance, one product, credit insurance, which is, I know, quite available in India, collectively, collectively, the banks in the UK, in the last three years, last four years, have paid out 44 billion pounds in redress. 44 billion pounds in redress, just on that one credit product, right? Because the, because the regulator changed the stance, and the regulator says, you've got to worry about the customer, right? And you've got to demonstrate at all points in time that the customer actually needed the product rather than being sold the product. And that's a very big thing. And by the way, the regulators are all talking to each other. In fact, I would submit the regulators are more coordinated around the big banks than the banks themselves are. I've worked for two big banks, Siri and uh, Barclays. It's difficult to break silos in any of these big organizations. The regulators across the world get together and they break silos like no other. So when we, talk about, when we talk about digital, it's therefore not only restricted to a particular area, it actually covers every single function. Marketing tech is just an incredible thing. Gone are the days when you had a fantastic marketing director who came in, built a brand, and you know, did a lot of advertising on TV. That's all gone. Today, with data management platforms and the ability to actually track customers, where they're kind of visiting, what are the kind of stuff they're doing, and actually delivering upon that is a completely different ball game. The kind of people we need in marketing today is completely different from what we needed a couple of years ago. So I always tell the, the legal people, the compliance people, it's all fine to sit down and tell me what went wrong three years ago, five years ago. Who really cares? That I'll figure out. You tell me what sins I'm creating today, which will become future sins of the past, which other managements will come and they will say, what the hell were these schmucks doing uh, three or four years ago? So therefore, it's people like legal and compliance and uh, you know, those folks that have to get really and truly digital if we've got to survive in this kind of thing. So that's the first kind of point. Let's say this is what really the notion of digital is, right? It's much, much, much more. Now, these advances offer tremendous, tremendous opportunities for big banks, clearly, right? There are tremendous, tremendous opportunities for big banks, and you see a lot of big banks around the world talking about, in the retail banking world, taking cost-income ratios down from traditionally 60% to now down to 40%. Commonwealth Bank runs with a cost-income ratio close to 40, 39, 40. Maybe, I don't know about the banks in India, but at least overseas, 39, 40 cost-income ratio is like completely off the charts. So you feel very happy about that, right? And you say this is the opportunity, but remember this also opens up the financial services industry to competition like never before. Every time you meet a banker, usually the banker complains about regulators. The regulators are giving us a hard time, they've taken up our capital, they've changed our liquidity, they made us do ring fencing, they made us do this, they made us do that. I am deeply thankful to the regulators. I am deeply thankful to the regulators. Had it not been for the regulators, our industry would have got disrupted much, 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 much earlier. And you've seen the cost of disruption in other industries, whether it was selling books, whether it was movies, whether it was buying cars, whichever particular industry. The financial services industry has taken time to get disrupted because of the regulators. In that context, what is happening in India is actually fascinating. 
is absolutely fascinating. If you think about all the companies in the world, all the fancy tech companies in the world, be it you know the mighty Google, be it the mighty Apple, all of them have stayed away from the plumbing of the financial services industry. The reason they stayed away from the plumbing of the financial services industry is because they don't want to go spend time with the regulators. They want us to spend time with the regulators. They want to just own the layer and own the customer. In India, with things like Aadhaar, with things like the ability to do digital ID, with things like you know common KYC, with the financial infrastructure now being owned by the government, this really opens the doors for these guys to come in and disrupt the industry in such a transformational way that I think that the banks here and the large financial institutions here, frankly, even the small financial institutions here, have to really think about how they're going to plot their way forward and what they're really going to do. Subject for a different conversation, but clearly a very interesting conversation that we should talk about. So, the bank's great opportunity, we must take it on. It is a transformation. I tell you, the transformation is happening at such a rapid pace. It's happening at such a rapid pace, and trying to keep control over it is virtually impossible. Once you're riding the tiger, once you're on the treadmill, there's no slowing down. You just got to completely keep running on the treadmill. The amount of money that we are spending on technology is just incredible. It's really incredible. I mean, the numbers are quite staggering. And you wonder what kind of company you are. Are you really a bank? Are you a technology company? Or are you an information business altogether? And I'll come back to that particular point. It also changes, therefore, the requirements and the pressure that you're putting on the teams and the people, right? Gone, definitely gone are the good old days when the bankers could go out for lunch. And, you know, and at least in the UK, they even used to have alcohol over lunch. That's definitely all kind of gone, right? Nowadays, it's all a matter of how quickly can you move. And, you know, all these words like agile and lean and all that has kind of come in. But the ability to move really, really quickly. Gone are the days when you could come and the technology person came and told you, hey, I'm going to replace all your back-end systems. By the way, it's going to cost you a billion dollars. And by the way, I'll deliver it to you in three years and deliver it actually in five years. All that is kind of all gone through the window. You've got to learn and live in the stage, live in the age of how do you deliver a minimum viable proposition, how are you going to do beta testing, and how are you going to continue to kind of evolve because things are just rapidly kind of changing. I'll come back to that one as well. Think about the customer, and think about the customer adoption. This is a very, very interesting, uh, very interesting kind of thing. Many a times on our mobile banking app, we launch a new feature, a simple new feature. So for example, just uh, three days ago, we launched the ability of a customer to switch on and off the debit card. So the customer can switch on and off the debit card completely. The customer can switch it on and off for, let's say, international spend, just from a safety kind of perspective. It always amazes me, always amazes me how customer adoption takes off. Customer experience rules the roost. If you get the customer experience right, the customer adoption takes off like no other. That is the good news. The bad news is what is the customer really doing and how much does the customer really realize what is going on? How many times, how many times have you ever gone and Googled yourself? If you ever Google yourself, you will be stunned as to the amount of information there is on you. Do you really need to say, me, my wife, my two kids, on a beach, in Spain, out for the week? You might as well put up a whole sign and say, come burgle my home, right? And therefore, thinking about the digital footprint you let, and Lata kind of talked a little bit about this, but we actually did an experiment in London, literally a kind of stage with a form, people sitting at the behind with computers and stuff like that, anybody, literally off the streets in a mall, asked the person's name, asked a couple of questions, which were getting relayed at the back, they were Googling, and the person at the back could find out so much. So the person at the back suddenly whispers you know, on, on, on a wireless, tells the person who's talking to the thing, ask about their golden retriever. And this guy turned around and says, hey, Jane, but how's your golden retriever Timmy doing? And the lady is completely stunned, completely stunned. How did you know about Timmy? Right? The thing is that we put out so much information. We put out so much information. And therefore, in this digital age, where have the rules been written about digital etiquette? Where have the rules been written about digital safety? 
And who is going to take responsibility for really writing these rules around digital uh, etiquette, digital safety? By the way, who's going to take responsibility when things go wrong in this world of digital safety? Moving on, I've now come to believe that whenever there is a significant change in business, in, in, in technology, things like the internet, things like the mobile, usually the first step is people try and just use that technology and publish a lot of brochure way, right? Take whatever you've got, shove it onto the internet, shove it onto the mobile, and see how it kind of works. Obviously, that does not work. Obviously, that does not work, so you quickly realize, no, 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 that's not the smart thing to do. We've got to build transactional capability. And frankly, all banks around the world, wherever I go around the world, I see banks going crazy trying to put every single transaction they can on the mobile. There are implications of doing that, like we talked about, as to what happens to sales and stuff like that. But anyway, generally speaking, a good thing to put transactions on, on the mobile and on the internet, get as much done as possible in a digital way. But I have sincerely come to believe that the real power of the technology comes when new business models evolve. When new business models evolve that actually give, which actually only become possible because of the digital technology. Let me give you a simple example. All of you in the room must have heard about Uber. At the end of the day, what is Uber? Uber is a series of APIs. It's a series of APIs connecting on a platform. The platform connects people who want to go drive a car versus people who want to take a ride. And that's about it. Now, the valuation of Uber before all this drama was $60 billion. Uh, that's, by the way, nearly double the valuation of Barclays, right? And I'm sure, you know, many times the valuation of a lot of banks in this room. And so you think about it and you say, those, those guys figured out, figured out that you can create a platform economy, right, just connecting drivers and passengers. And I, sitting in the UK, have 24 million, 24 million individual customers, which is roughly, roughly half the size of the UK, right? A million SME customers and 25,000 of the largest corporates. Now, I have built a one-on-one -on -one relationship with each one of them. I have never allowed these people to actually conduct business on my platform. And if I start allowing them to conduct business on my platform, then what does that mean for my business? And if my natural market share by product is something like somewhere between 15 and 20 percent, then it has to be that about 20 percent of the GDP of the country is going through my pipes. And if 20 percent of the GDP of the country is going through my pipes, shame on me for not being able to monetize that. And the valuation creation for living in this platform connected world is an amazing thing. And that's why these new business models have to evolve which will become available because of these kind of technologies. And that is what I think will make companies uh, kind of win. We talked a little, about, a little bit about, uh, we talked a little bit about data and how data is really, really critical. So data architecture, what is the kind of data architecture you're going to kind of put out there? What is the data governance and usage? And you can see that these creation of these big data lakes and what is available today using platforms like Hadoop is like incredible. I'm not a tech guy, but what I've realized is Hadoop seems to be like, you know, a millions, millions and millions of rows, millions and millions of columns, right? And for each individual person, you can actually put as many attributes as you like, and you can build it out. We are in the process of building a complete UK registry that is actually saying, how do I get data on virtually every single person in the UK? Right? On some, I have very, very little data. On some, I have a lot of data. But how, through every single interaction, can I get better at it? How can I actually put a tag as to the recency of the data, and therefore the validity of the data, and how do we kind of build it around? Now, data is actually becoming so important that the European, uh, the, the European, uh, Central, uh, European Central Bank, the European regulators in the UK have come out with something called PSD2, which is Payment Services Directive 2, and what the UK has taken to one step ahead, which they call open banking. So what basically the regulators are saying, to break the stronghold of the big banks on data, they're going to force the big banks to actually allow a customer to move data from one place to the other. So where these fantastic companies, obviously doing exceptionally well, 
He doesn't have transactional data, but if Vedi was sitting in the UK after 13th of Jan 2018, Vedi's customer could actually go and get a loan from Vedi, and Vedi would be able to take, with the customer's consent, data from any bank, be it HDFC, Access, Barclays, or whatever, and give that data to Vedi. What that therefore means is that I must have in place the ability to ingest data, the ability to ingest data, first of all, render the data on maybe mobile in a way that makes sense to the customer, and then think of various use cases where I use the data to really bring advantage to the customer. So no longer are you competing for an account. No longer are you competing only for a customer. What you're competing for is every single payment. Because if you're getting, for example, cash back on petrol from one bank, and you're getting cash back for, let's say, groceries from another bank, you technically can actually divert the entire spending on groceries through one bank and your entire spending on petrol through another bank. It's a different story as to what happens to the model in the bank, which model that I can give 2% away cash back on groceries because I'm going to make it up on everything else, right? Or that, you know, after $200 of spend, I'm going to allow, stop the customer from doing it. The customer, if, he's, if he or she is savvy, will be able to do things differently. Open banking is going to force us to rethink business models completely. But the ability to ingest the data and do something with the data in real time is going to become critical. And then that's going to allow the personalization if you can do it in real time, and obviously it has to be backed up by instant fulfillment as we talked about, because otherwise there's no real point in making an offer which you can't kind of fulfill. It's also very, very interesting when you start thinking about the unintended consequences, or consequences of digital. You'll be surprised to know that the fraud levels in the UK are roughly two and a half times in terms of rate, basis points, of that of the US. In the US, it's very, very, you know, people are so cool about giving away social last four digits of your social on the phone or putting it on the internet. Right? And yet fraud levels in the US are incredibly low. US did not even introduce chip and pin. Right? We are still in the process of putting chip and pin into the US. It's virtually all over the world. The UK fraud levels are completely off the charts. Don't know why. Right? But it is just the fact. So what happens with the digital, what you're really trying to do is you're really trying to get a phenomenal customer experience and allow for speed. So you allow the customer to do whatever he or she wants to do really, really, really quickly, right? And so if a fraudster gets hold of your account, the fraudster's ability to move money from your account through the system and out is just incredible. So the unintended consequences of making it so easy is you see things like fraud going up. And therefore, how do you start now introducing friction, purposeful friction, into these customer journeys? So now we are having things like, in mobile banking, contextual questioning, where you tell a customer, if a customer is making a transaction which is out of character of the transaction that the customer normally makes, we actually show the customer a page which says, stop and think literally says, stop and think, right? Are you really doing this kind of transaction? Now, I know in India you get an SMS and all of that, but the SMS is post the transaction being made, not pre the transaction being made. Now, OTPs are there, OTPs are, are uncomfortable way. Plus, SMS is not a cheap thing to do. So how do you do this in an in-app notification, and how do you do it differently is a big, big, big deal. Of course, the new C word, of course, the new C word is no longer cancer, it is cyber. And if you look at what's happening in cyber and you look at what happened just a couple of weeks back with Equifax, 145 million records, name, date of birth, and identity, all gone. Really, really, really scary, right? I read in the reports that there were some cyber attacks in, uh, for a couple of government companies in India. Not sure if that's true or not, but what I'm saying is, it honestly has become a situation. It honestly has become a situation where it's not a matter of if you will get attacked. It's a matter of when you will get attacked. It's a matter of, frankly, who is the weakest link in this kind of chain? And what are we going to do 
as the weakest links, as, as people who don't want to be the weakest links in the chain. I remember when I was growing up 30, 40 years ago, a bank was always considered a big vault. And if it was, you had a big, strong vault, it was considered to be a strong bank. Then, of course, banks went on and started advertising huge, phenomenal buildings. We have this beautiful building, beautiful lobbies, you know, to demonstrate strength, to demonstrate power, right? That we can afford this kind of things. Today, if anything, the one who's got the strongest padlock is the one that you really want to trust your data with. Losing your data, getting your data or your identity compromised is such, it's such a violation of one's uh, privacy and it hurts in a completely different way. Now, in the US, interestingly, interestingly, the US has already started coming around saying who should pay for these kind of things. When Target and everybody had their data kind of leaked, they, all the banks got together. They had, of course, to replace all the credit cards and stuff, stuff like that. The merchants were forced to pick up the bill by the associations, by Visa, MasterCard, and stuff like that. Those rules have still not been written for the rest of the world. And those rules is what we will have to write as to who is going to take accountability for these kinds of things. Can you just imagine, I mean, God forbid, something like Amazon gets hacked. Can you think about everybody who's a prime customer losing all that kind of data? A very, very, very scary kind of thing. What is fantastic in this world, what is fantastic in this world is that there are no friends and frankly, there are no enemies. The most important partner, the most important partner today is, at least for us, and I'm sure for all the banks in this room, Apple and Android. My entire mobile platform runs on Apple and Android, right? I'm, but despite being you know, so dependent upon them, I'm hugely dependent in the sense, every time there's a new iOS release, they're not sharing the iOS release with me before that. It's going to happen, and I need to scramble to make sure that my security is working, things have not been compromised, what has really happened, and stuff like that. Yet, somebody like an Apple absolutely arm twists its way into the payment space. The three-party model for uh, payments on the credit card, on the debit card, has been around for 50 years, maybe 60 years. And suddenly, Apple comes in and takes a bite of the pie and takes a bite of the pie because it owns the hardware, because that hardware is somebody is something that a customer loves. Now, Apple, at least, is not retaining all the data. We know Google loves data. So what is the data that Google is keeping on you? And how are they utilizing? And it's not, you know, it's fantastic, right? If you use, even if you don't use Gmail, your calendar gets automatically populated when you book an airline ticket. So Google, on your iPad, is actually populating your calendar when you're actually booking a ticket and it's showing up in your Yahoo Mail, right? Where, how does this all kind of end? And who is your real friend, right? Take, take for example, uh, so you, you, you get my drift, right? Apple, Android are just one example. If you're not eating out of somebody else's lunchbox, if you're not eating out of somebody else's lunchbox, you are bound to go hungry because definitely somebody is eating out of your lunchbox. And therefore, whose lunchbox are you going to be eating out of and how are you going to define that game becomes absolutely critical. Linked to this is this whole point around building strategic relationships, right? A lot of us have grown up where we've said, yes, you know, this is the technology partner we're going to go uh, after. This is going to be the core of our system. We're going to build out, this is a 10-year relationship, a 20-year relationship. We've done that at Siri. Banish, you know, has done a lot of that kind of stuff around the world, converging onto, onto various platforms. But how do you really think about that? Take the cloud, for example. How does somebody make a decision whether that person should go onto AWS? Should that person go onto uh, uh, Microsoft Azure? Should that person go onto Salesforce Cloud? Or should that person go on to Google? You have to believe that the basics of scalability, the basics of cyber, that's going to be, you know, hygiene. And therefore, what is it that you're going to be looking for when you actually build out into the cloud? Are you going to depend on AWS's ability to actually uh, provide you the cheapest kind of price? 
what are the kind of machine learning and AI does uh, somebody like an AWS uh, give you? Do you want a complete CRM integration, right? Do you want a complete CRM integration with Salesforce? Or do you believe in what Satya is saying about giving you a complete consolidated stack of cloud on-prem device, what he calls you know, the cloud and the intelligence, uh, intelligence edge, right? How do you make these calls and who do you, who is going to win? Do you feel comfortable saying, I think X is going to win and therefore I'm going to back X? Or are you going to take multiple bets? And if you're going to take multiple bets, then what does that do to your architecture and how are you going to double up to make sure that your architecture then learns and actually behaves in this case in an active, active way on these kind of two tech stacks? How do you kind of think about those kinds of things? And finally, let's come back to our favorite, the regulator. It's fascinating that every time, you know, for the last four or five years, I've been talking about regulator obviously having an impact on our business, and I've said technology is the other thing having a huge impact on the business. For the first time, the regulator and technology have come together. The regulator is pushing us hard to get into the new digital age. Open banking is something that is being driven by the regulators, right? But one has to also try and figure out how much does the regulator really understand about the implications of these kinds of things? Do, do they have the resources to be able to look forward and understand it? Do they understand where the money is lying? A lot of us talk about wallets. Today, PayPal, PayPal is a very, very, very big bank. PayPal has a lot of deposits. PayPal is not regulated as every other big bank. Now, that's great news for PayPal, but how does that really mean from a regulator point of view when the regulator is thinking about the systemic vulnerabilities within, uh, within the system? Which brings me to the final point, and that is, you know, this is something that's worrying me at a personal level, which really says that in this digital age, the biggest issue is actually people. The biggest issue is people. 25 years ago, or 30 years ago, when Jerry decided to hire people like me, he chose me, I'm a chartered accountant, and you know, said fine, I'll take a bet on this guy, right? In today's world, Jerry would have never hired me. Because the kind of people you need today are not people who are chartered accountants and stuff like that. You need, today if we are a technology company, what would a technology company hire? And therefore, how are we going to take how are we going to take this huge set of folks who are in the banking industry and how are we going to make them tech savvy? Because if the senior managers in a bank don't understand or don't appreciate the art of the possible with technology, like I said, technology is too important to be left to the technologist. Business people have to take the lead around technology and if the business people are not able to articulate what is the art of the possible or where they want to go, then unfortunately those organizations will find it very, very, very difficult to survive. And therefore, this transformation is a big transformation at a cultural level. Forget about all the functions, even at a cultural level, this is an incredible transformation that we are kind of going through. Like I said right at the beginning, my God, I have never, ever, ever been so excited because I don't think I've ever been on such a rapid learning curve. Last week I spent four or five days in San Francisco. You meet all these companies and the kinds of things that they're telling you about, the kinds of things that you learn. When you sit down with people at Microsoft and you say, hey, tell me about the digital transformation that you've been. When you read a book on Amazon and the book talks about the world's greatest store, the book talks about how the biggest peef point of people at Amazon is legacy systems. And Amazon was only 1991. And if they're talking about legacy systems, how does a bank, which is 327 years old, older than the United States of America, think about its platforms? So extremely challenging, extremely challenging, extremely exciting, but hell, it also keeps me very, very paranoid. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your time.